So Dr. Cheng, uh, obviously one of the main topic this year is uh, everything around uh, artificial intelligence. Oh, yeah. uh, what is the difference between hope and hype? <laughs> Sometimes very little. Um, we in radiology have always been suspect to buying into hype of any potential disruptive technology. W w there's nothing new about this. Gardner talks about the Gardner hype curve. We in radiology and medicine in general are very susceptible to buying into hype of any technology. For instance, years ago, uh, just a few years ago, we talked about big data. That was something that was going to disrupt and change and change how we practice radiology. Decades ago, even PACS, digital imaging, was considered, oh, that's going to change radiology, it's going to r ruin what we're going to do. We have gone through this ride multiple times, and the, typically the ride is the following. We buy into the hype prematurely, but eventually we learn to what I call appropriately consume the technology. All right? The problem is it takes a lot longer than most people think for us to do it. Now, what happens then is when we eventually do appropriately consume the technology, in retrospect when people ask, so what was the impact of deep learning or big data or PACS, people scratch their head and goes, eh, it's routine, no big deal. And the reason for that is we learn, we're very good at learning to re-engineer ourselves. We learned how to adopt appropriately technology or capability that allows us to add value to our patients, but it's as, it's as such a slow pace, it never feels like a, a, a revolution. The revolution, all the hype, all the fear happens in the beginning. All right? And then what happens then is because the hype tends to overpromise and the delay is longer than we expect, people and go... then become reality. Then it becomes reality and by the time it becomes reality, it's like routine and it's not a big deal. So the message to the young radiologist, nothing to be scared of. Not only nothing to be scared of, but something that hopefully to hope that we actually break through this normal delay. And the reason I mention that is we're going to need something to help us. Right now, we are barely able to maintain what we're doing. Imaging studies are getting increasingly more complex. And they're not only getting larger as far as the number of images, they're becoming more complex with respect to the functional and physiologic data that can be derived from that. Our physicians, our patients are demanding a much more precise interpretation and diagnosis. We want to maximally leverage the information from these data sets. That is extraordinarily difficult to do manually. And we want it instantly. Absolutely. So what I would say to young radiologists is I hope by the time I'm practicing radiology we actually have learned how to appropriately adopt and consume these newer machine intelligent technologies because we're going to need something to help. What I actually explain to my residents is don't think about artificial intelligence, don't think about deep learning. These are capabilities, you know, these are tools. Tools are nothing until they become adopted into true solutions. And they're not the only tools that are going to help us re-engineer ourselves. We have Bayesian networks, we have uh, um, uh, large decision support systems that go beyond just the traditional machine intelligence. The key point is that right now we need something to help us and if we don't have something like these tools, we're going to suffer in with, with respect to the uh, fulfilling the expectations and requirements of providing quality work to our patients. Can you tell us a little bit what is the difference between machine learning and deep learning? Because this word, yeah. you know, deep, deep is, is kind of scary. Right. So, um, the way I usually explain this is, first of all, there's nothing new about this. I mean, the, everyone thinks deep learning is something that's relatively new. We've had this for, for decades. The, the thing that has made it more real is not so much the mathematics behind it. Now, that's unfair to our data scientists. There's always been progress. But the fundamental difference is the fact that our children play video games and shoot aliens on Xbox and video games. And what I mean by that is the mathematics of deep learning and artificial intelligence is very similar to the same mathematics, or at least similar to the same mathematics as what is required to do video games. And the video game industry has exploded, all right? And the, tech, the enabling technology of video games is these graphic processor units, the so-called GPUs, NVIDIA, AMD, these companies, these, these video cards, these graphic processor units have allowed video gaming to be real, 
It happens to be also the same technology that allows bit mining, cryptocurrency, that's why Bitcoin and all that, but it also is the technology that allows us to do deep learning much better in a deeper way and faster. And so the first thing I always remind people when it comes to about deep learning is this is nothing new. What's new is that we can actually do it now practically. Now, you ask the question, what's the difference between that and not? The best way to explain this is first, I feel that within the realm of computer science, this is all within the concept of data science. Okay, now the reason I mentioned data science is the fundamental difference in deep learning and these applications is as opposed to the traditional computer science program, the computer science program is driven by an algorithm. In other words, I have a set of instructions that basically, and the computer follows those instructions. The big difference in machine intelligence and deep learning is the driving force is not so much the set of instructions, but rather the data that the data is drive the data are driving everything. And so I basically view artificial intelligence as a subset of the broad field of computer science we call data science. Now within data science you have a subset called artificial intelligence. Now that's poorly defined. It's kind of uh, people kind of have a hand waving definition that artificial intelligence computers that kind of mimic what we normally or traditionally would think humans would do. It's a not a satisfying, satisfying uh, definition. That's why a lot of us don't like the word AI. But within that large AI, we have something called machine intelligence, right? Or machine learning, all right? Now, machine learning has been with us for decades. We use this all the time. For instance, our traditional CAD programs for breast and lung cancer that we've used for decades around the world, that's a good example of a machine intelligent or machine learning system. Now, here's the fundamental difference between machine learning and deep learning all right, or machine intelligence. The traditional like CAD program actually uses very similar mathematics, statistical mathematics as deep learning, but the difference is the following. If you were designing traditionally a CAD system, you had, would have to have a priori a model and we call that a feature model. And you would hand build those features, right? In other words, you would say, I think cancers have ill-defined borders. So I'm going to build a mathematical convolution or filter to detect those abnormalities. Or I think tumors look funny in their uh, attenuation. So you would a priori hand build these features. And now you're going to build from data. Exactly. The difference about deep learning is it's actually you can be lazy now. You can say, you know what, I don't have a preconceived model, but I don't have to. If I have a lot of data that's proven, we call it annotated, that actually has proof, and I feed it into this, it turns out very similar to logistic regression, principal component analysis, cluster analysis. It's a statistical method. You can feed it data and then give it feedback, like, no, you were wrong, you were right. It can automatically adjust, just like a regression curve. You know, you feed it data, and then it comes up with a regression line, or what we call hyperplane. That's exactly what deep learning does. It's a little bit more complex, but it's essentially the same idea. It eventually, if you feed it enough data that's vetted or annotated, it comes up with the features by themselves. Nothing scary and all that. You mentioned the word deep. I think deep is a good word because deep means two things, at least in my mind. Deep meaning very capable. All right, very capable, and it is. We have we have we hold great promise for it. But there's another problem with that word deep. Deep as in obscure. It's so deep, I can't see anything, okay? Obscure is a problem, that's one of the challenges about deep learning, as opposed to the more traditional other machine intelligent or machine learning approaches like CAD. See, when you look at a CAD program and you're trying to get, convince someone like me to use it for their patients or to get governmental regulation certification, like CE certification, you have to convince them that it's, it works. And there are two ways you can do that with a traditional machine learning approach like CAD. You can basically say, look, here's my statistical analysis. We did it on a lot of patients, and here's my ROC curve. It works. But you can also show them, here's my underlying feature model. Here's what I use. I, my hypothesis is that tumors are indistinct, so I built this filter. You can show that and say, you know what, that's reasonable. Not only do you have statistical stuff, you have features. And you can't do that with deep. Deep learning, that's more difficult. Deep learning, you just have statistical, and that's the problem. We need a lot of data. Here's the problem. We don't have a lot of data. 
to me, the, one of the biggest challenges of deep learning is not the deep learning so much, is the fact that we are constrained by data availability. Because remember, deep learning is a brute force method. It's almost dumb in a way. You don't have to have a preconceived model. You don't have to be clever, but you have to have a lot of data. Data drives everything here. And unfortunately, our existing infrastructures in most hospitals, we lack that sophisticated ability to provide, to feed or even consume these deep learning systems at scale. And that's going to be one of the biggest challenges. So some say that uh, data is going to be the next gold mine. Yes. Yes. And in fact, what we're seeing this right now, we have this race because many of us users, we don't understand that the biggest fundamental change in my mind from a cultural perspective and power relationship is, is deep learning. It's not the computer algorithm that's in charge. It's the data that's the boss. The data are everything. And who owns the data? We users own the data. Our patients own the data. And what a lot of vendors and a lot of investigators are racing is they're trying to exploit the fact that we as users are relatively ignorant about that fact. So they'll knock on our, the big boys, you know, we'll, not, the big data companies will knock on our door and says, we would like your data, all right, as if we're doing them a favor. When we really, real, the value is the data. And we need to come up with a model, as I said, we need to come up with infrastructural capabilities to allow us to fully leverage our data stores in a way that previously we couldn't do. Because if we don't do that, we're going to impede the progress of this technology. We're going to result in use cases or applications that are actually don't solve problems but are created because of data availability constraint right and I, I see that now a lot of the use cases they're nice to haves but they're not must haves and the reason why they're nice to haves is because they were driven by data availability wouldn't it be better to be driven not by data availability but by actual useful things that are going to improve efficiency, reduce error, improve value and outcome for our patients. But that's going to require the ability to extract data driven throughout the enterprise. And that's a challenge. Talking about data, and that's going to be my last question, you know, we uh, also uh, have to tackle the issue of uh, cyber security. Yes. Okay, so cyber, so that's actually a very good point for a number of reasons at multiple levels. So for instance, there is this dialectic that we have to go this challenge. At one end of the spectrum, we want to be able to expose high quality data that's vetted. So we want to do that at scale. But at the same time, we need to protect the security and privacy of our patients. That's a non-trivial task, all right? So absolutely there. But it goes even beyond that because for many of us, we believe that it's not just deep learning. The deep learning is one of many what I call human machine cybernetic decision support collaboration tools that we're going to need to help us provide value. Many of those tools are going to reside in the cloud. We are, unlike other industries, we tend to be very early in the stage of cloud and we tend not to trust cloud yet precisely because of your example. We are so bad, our, I don't know about France, but in the States, Every day I read an article or newspaper article where there's been a security breach in hospitals. We tend to be pretty primitive when it comes to security and privacy. We're getting better, but we're bad. So here's my problem. I'm not even good at taking care of my own data that I control within my firewall. How am I going to trust using resources in the web, uh, in the cloud, where I can't even get my own act together? So your question is actually very important because, and this contributes to the reason why it's going to take a lot longer than we think. Because a lot of these mundane but important concerns like security, data availability, validation, these things that aren't sexy, they don't make the news, they're not hyping, are the things that, that result in us taking a lot longer than most people think in appropriately consuming this. These are still early times. Okay, to conclude, you said that, uh, I heard you say that uh, artificial intelligence is like uh, a car and uh, we are in a car anyway right. and uh, we could be either uh, on the driver's seat or either in the trunk. Are you still okay with that? Absolutely, because as I said, the thing that's going to drive this are the use cases. Can What are the actual applications that are actually going to help us as physicians help our patients? 
the engineers are brilliant people, the data scientists, brilliant people, computer scientists, brilliant people, but they don't understand the use cases. We have to stay engaged not only to define the appropriate use case, how appropriately to consume this technology, but we're the ones that have to know how to validate these technologies in a safe way. One of the fears I see, especially in younger radiologists who are terrified, some, some of them I've talked to say, I don't want to go into radiology because we're going to be replaced. That's not true. People have shown, even the people who are very sophisticated in this, AI works best with people, not replacing people, augmenting people. Like I said, human machine cybernetic collaboration. But the key point here is we, if we don't get involved, all right, the car is going to move one way or another. If we don't drive the car, we'll be in the trunk and we may not want to know where we go. We need to drive this process because if we do that, we'll do well by our patients. And that's the important thing. Thank you very much for your time. Thank so you. much, so many information to process. Thank you very much once again. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Thank you.